It's saying I can't. to remind everyone that after the talk today there will be a reception downstairs um, it's outside so whether you're joining us on youtube or in person please join us for the reception there will be food and drinks and a chance to talk to the speaker so just a reminder for everybody about that and today's speaker is dr kara andres she did her master's at St. Louis University with Jason Knopf. She then did her PhD at Cornell University, working on um, studying fish diversity with environmental DNA in David Lodge's lab. And she now joins us as one of the new LAC postdocs. She'll be working on fish microbiomes here with Feng Shang Ling and Jason Knopf. So welcome, Karen. Thanks. All right, thank you, Stella, for that introduction. Um, yeah, as Stella said, I am a brand new LEC postdoc, and I wanna thank both the Living Earth Collaborative and EEPB for allowing me to come give the seminar today. Um, yep, I'm a new postdoc, so today I'm actually going to be talking primarily about my dissertation research, uh, where I was using environmental DNA to study um, species richness, genetic diversity, and species abundance of uh, freshwater invasive species. Oops, let's see how we can advance. Where might my cursor be? Oh, the way. Okay, I'm not being allowed to advance. Okay, there. Anyway, all right, so humanity depends on healthy ecosystems and the services that they provide. Um, so these benefits, which include food and medicine, uh, materials um, and energy, underpin um, basically every aspect of human development. So in general, when we think about healthy ecosystems, we think about high levels of biodiversity, um, whether that be um, diverse species assemblages or high levels of genetic diversity uh, within species. But we know that biodiversity at all scales, um, including diversity within and among species is declining now at a faster rate than at any time in human history. And this is due to influences such as habitat segmentation, uh, climate change, invasive species and other factors. So this figure here is showing the percentage of species that are considered threatened according to the IUCN Red List criteria. And for the species for which we have adequate data, it's estimated that about 25% of species are considered threatened. But you can see in the gray bars within each of these taxonomic group or the gray segment of the bars within these taxonomic groups, that there's plenty of species for which we just don't have enough data. And these data deficiencies uh, can make assessing population trends and understanding the severity of this threat, um, as well as designing solutions to the biodiversity crisis, uh, particularly challenging. So when we think about studying and monitoring and conserving ecosystems, there's two broad types of data uh, that we really need to get. So we need information on diversity, um, whether that's diversity within or among species, and we need information about abundance. So the number of individuals that belong to each of those uh, diverse groups. But in many ecosystems, this data is not straightforward to collect. So um, plenty of ecosystems can be really challenging or even impossible to sample. Um, and the existing gears that we have to sample these ecosystems can be really biased, both in terms of the number and the types of species that they're collecting. 
So this is where environmental DNA enters the picture. So it's now understood that as species are moving through their environment, they're constantly shedding genetic material into their surroundings. And that we can actually take an environmental sample, collect that genetic material, and learn something about both the diversity and abundance of the species living in that ecosystem. The general workflow in environmental DNA starts with the collection of an environmental sample. So in the case of an aquatic ecosystem, uh, that would be collecting a water sample. And the DNA that you're collecting in that environmental sample is then concentrated by filtering and then extracted. So at this point, the sample is containing all of the DNA from all the materials that you collected in the environment, including a lot of non-target species. So to make it easier to study a focal species or group of species, we then amplify a target gene region through polymerase chain reaction. Um, and then proceeding through the next steps will depend on the exact um, objectives of the study that you're looking at. So I wanna take a moment to think about the exact, the particular gene regions that we're targeting in environmental DNA research. So in eukaryotes, we have um, the mitochondrial genome and the nuclear genome, and we can target markers in each of these, in either of these uh, genomes. So mitochondrial markers, this includes things like CO1, uh, 12S. These are really common in environmental DNA and barcoding and metabarcoding studies um, in general. This is because we do expect that cells contain many more mitochondria than nuclei. So we expect that mitochondrial DNA is going to be much more common in environmental samples uh, than nuclear DNA. But the mitochondrial genome is maternally inherited and it doesn't recombine. So as a whole, it represents just a single independent genetic marker. So we, by looking at um, genes within the mitochondrial genome, we're really just getting a single um, a single focus onto, into the genetic diversity of that species. And we may be limited in terms of the, um, into the resolution of the genetic information that we can obtain looking at mitochondrial markers. So nuclear DNA, on the other hand, uh, this includes things like microsatellites or SNPs, um, is not really common in environmental DNA research. Again, this is because we expect that nuclear DNA is not going to be as common in environmental samples, but because it recombines, um, we can now target multiple regions in the nuclear genome. So we could look at uh, dozens, hundreds, thousands of genetic markers within the nuclear genome and start to get much more detailed population genetic and the assessments. So to answer different questions about diversity and abundance using environmental DNA, it's important to consider the specific genetic region that we're looking at. And I'm gonna situate different genetic markers within this space. So looking at both the variability of the genetic marker showing on the y-axis, as well as the taxonomic resolution of the resulting analyses that we can accomplish shown on the x-axis. So walking us up these, these axes, we could look at conserved mitochondrial DNA markers. So these are gonna be like your cytochrome oxidase one, really common in environmental DNA metabarcoding research. This is gonna give us high resolution at the species level. We'll be able to detect single species or characterize entire species um, assemblages. We could also look at more variable regions within the mitochondrial genome. And in this way, we may be able to start looking at um, at least broad patterns of interest specific genetic diversity or within species genetic diversity. But if we wanna start getting um, detailed population genetic assessments, we really need to start looking at nuclear genetic markers and uh, preferably multiple um, multi-locus um, nuclear DNA markers. And then on the very high end of things, we may even be able to, out of environmental samples, obtain full, um, full cells or full um, genomes and get down to the individual level of taxonomic resolution in our analyses. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to walk us through studies um, that I um, accomplished during my PhD dissertation research um, that's gonna cover um, at least the first three categories of these different genetic markers. So starting with conserved mitochondrial markers. For this research, I partnered with uh, researchers at the Cornell Biological Field Station, and this is situated on Oneida Lake, which is a large inland lake in upstate New York. And at this biological field station, they conduct fish community surveys every year. They've done this for um, several decades now. And so every year throughout the entire sampling season, they're going out, they're sampling the fish communities with a combination of fike netting, gill netting, seining, and electrofishing. 
Um, and this is based on my understanding that different types of gear are gonna be able to target different types of species, but by using multiple gears, we can better characterize the full community. So in 2017, we went out and we added an environmental DNA survey on top of those um, um, you know, physical capture sampling gears. And the relative size of the circles is showing the relative number of species that was detected within each of those sampling surveys that year. So you can already see environmental DNA detected more species than any of those other gears. But if we look at that data in a different way, so looking at the accumulated number of species that is detected with each of those gears, uh, any given level of effort or work hours that it took to collect that data, you can start to learn something about the efficiency of these gears. So what I'm showing here um, is that electrofishing and seining detected more species more efficiently. So we see a, a more rapid rise in the number of species accumulated um, than bike netting or gill netting. And what I'm showing in the orange is the number of species detected for any amount of effort with all of those uh, traditional sampling gears combined. So environmental DNA, you can really see when we add that in there, rapidly outperforms um, the, any of those gears. And in fact, detects more species than all of those gears combined, um, 11 more species than all of those gears combined, and it does that more efficiently. So if we're going out and we're just going trying to sample the species or the fish community um, with just a single type of gear, an environmental DNA survey would be preferable. And that's uh, what we're showing here. But, you know, we may want to start thinking about how we can combine sampling gears. So, you know, just as I said, different types of sampling gears may be able to sample different species and different environments. What we wanted to do with this study was to see what is the optimal combination of gears? What is the optimal allocation of effort or cost to each of these gears to maximize the number of species we can detect? And so we ran this optimization um, analysis, which allows us to um, look at the, num the maximum number of species that we could detect for any amount of total work effort shown on the left or any amount of total cost shown on the right. And the um, different segments of the bars is showing the proportion um, or the distribution of effort or cost um, that would optimize the sampling of the fish community in those environments. So you can see it's wise to allocate most of our effort or most of our cost to environmental DNA, but by adding small amounts of seining or um, Fike netting, we can actually maximize species detections. And so this approach may be really useful for, um, for anyone trying to maximize the number of species that are being detected while minimizing the number, the amount of effort or the amount of cost it takes to detect those species. Okay, so I show you how we can use environmental DNA to detect diversity at the species level. Now moving up that axis, we can start to look at a more variable mitochondrial DNA marker to start to understand patterns of within species genetic diversity as well. For this, I'm gonna be talking about a project I'm working on with Christy Diner. And we were looking at the intraspecific genetic diversity of Lake Tanganyika cichlids using the ND2 mitochondrial marker, which is a little more, has a little more um, diversity than like cytochrome oxidase one would. So Lake Tanganyika famously hosts a really wide diversity of cichlid fish species. Um, and we expect really high levels of both um, among and within species diversity based on the known history of this lake. So I'm showing here a depth profile of the lake. You can see there's three major sub basins. And while they're all connected now, historically, they were physically separated from one another. So about 25,000 years ago, lake levels were much lower. What I'm showing here is the historical shoreline of Lake Tanganyika. Um, and in the dark gray, you can see those three distinct subbasins. So they were physically separated for about a period of 15,000 years. So even though lake levels are now higher and these populations could um, mix their genetic material, we might expect to see a legacy of the his this historical separation, physical separation of the subbasins. So we went out and we sampled um, environmental DNA at two of those subbasins. So I'm showing the northern subbasin in purple and the southern subbasin in green. Um, and we sampled environmental DNA. We amplified the ND2 mitochondrial gene region, and we took um, all of the sequences that we could assign to. I'm showing you here Petrochromus famula, just a single species. Um, and retained that within species genetic variation to start to understand spatial patterns of genetic variation in the species. 
So we constructed a haplotype network. So each haplotype is going to be a distinct genetic variant belonging to Petrochromis famula at this marker. And what I'm showing with this network is um, the different haplotypes are denoted with the different circles. The size of the circle is going to represent the relative abundance of that haplotype among all the populations. And the color of the pie pieces is going to represent the populations from where we found that haplotype. And then the length of the lines, as well as the dots along those lines, are going to represent the number of base pair differences between those different haplotypes, between the different genetic variants of this species. So to interpret this haplotype network for you, uh, we see two major haplotypes in the northern basin. They're all found at the purple sites in the north. And we see a few um, other haplotypes found in only the southern basin in the green. And these are separated by several base pair differences. And so what's remarkable is there's no shared haplotypes among the northern and the southern uh, basins. So there's complete genetic separation in this gene region um, of this species among, in those, among those basins. So with just an environmental DNA sample, we can start to learn broad genetic patterns of this species. But as I said earlier, an environmental DNA sample doesn't just contain genetic material for this one species, but it contains genetic material for a lot of species. So with just the same sample, we can construct haplotype networks for dozens of species at the same time, using the same approach, using the same laboratory um, protocols and the same sequences. So I'm just showing you here a few other um, cichlid species for which we can constructed haplotype networks. And so we can start to learn the patterns of biogeography, uh, phylogeography of multiple species, perhaps dozens of species all at once. So I've shown you now environmental DNA is really powerful for species detections as well as broad interest specific genetic patterns. And when I started my PhD, this is really where the limit of environmental DNA research was. We were really only looking at mitochondrial markers in the um, environmental DNA world. So what I wanted to do um, was to see if we could advance environmental DNA research um, into the nuclear DNA realm. Oh my goodness, it's only 417. Okay, I'm gonna slow down. Deep breaths. Okay. All right, where was I? Okay, so by moving into the um, nuclear genome, then we can start to understand patterns of uh, population allele frequencies. We can start to look at genetic diversity and differentiation. And we can also start to learn things about uh, population abundance. Okay, the focal species for this work, did not advance, um, is the round goby. Um, so this is an aquatic invasive species um, that was introduced to the Great Lakes Basin in about 1990 via ballast water from ships coming over from Eurasia. Um, this is the same um, place where we see a lot of aquatic invasive species, um, like zebra mussels are coming from the same region. Um, and since 1990, they have spread throughout the whole Great Lakes region uh, faster than any previous fish invader. So they're, they're really abundant, they're really pervasive. And where they're found, they can outcompete native species. So they outcompete um, other benthic fish species. Um, they also consume their, uh, their, they consume eggs of uh, fishery species. Um, and so they can present a real problem uh, where they're invaded. So they're now moving into inland lakes and tributaries and they've actually advanced towards the St. Louis area. And there's a worry that they'll get into the Merrimack River system and perhaps drive declines of native species in that ecosystem as well. So previous genetic work in this species has shown that across its invaded range, it does have high levels of genetic diversity. Um, so this is potentially because there were just a ton of individuals introduced at the original um, invasion or that they've, um, gene they've become genetically diverse um, since invasion, but there is high levels of genetic diversity um, across their invaded range. And we wanted to see if we could detect that genetic diversity using environmental DNA. All right, so like I said, it really had not been demonstrated that we could, we could pull out nuclear genetic information from environmental DNA samples. And so I wanted to first start with a mesocosm experiment just to demonstrate that this would be possible. Uh, so first I designed a microsatellite panel. So this is a nuclear genetic marker, microsatellite. And uh, this panel consisted of 28 loci or 28 genetic markers with an average of, of 9.4 alleles or 9.4 um, genetic variants at each of those loci. Uh, 
And then we set up a mesocosm experiment. We had 12 mesocosms that had different densities of round gobies. So they had either one, three, five, or 10 individual round gobies in each. And I collected round gobies from Cayuga Lake, which is in the background of that picture up there, um, and put them in these mesocosms, let them hang out for about an hour. And then I took an environmental DNA sample as well as a fin clip from each of the individuals in the mesocosms. So I had an, an eDNA sample as well as a tissue sample from all the uh, mesocosms. So I do wanna take a moment just to talk about what type of data we're working with. So I said we have microsatellites. Um, so a microsatellite is defined as a tandem repeat region in the nuclear genome. So we have this TTCA, TTCA, TTCA repeat region. So each allele or each genetic variant at this locus is gonna be um, defined by a different number of repeats in that region. And so we're genotyping each individual round goby from the tissues using sequencing. Okay, so genotyping by sequencing um, just means we put that through sequencer and we see what alleles are most common um, in that sample and then we genotype that individual based on the most common alleles that we see. So this is pretty easy when we're just looking at a single individual. So what I'm showing in the left histogram is a, what we might get from the sequencer for a single individual. So this individual, there's you know, five total alleles, but there's two major alleles. And we know we have a diploid species, so we would call this a heterozygous AB at that, at that locus. But there are some low frequency alleles hanging out there. So that's um, reads, sequencing reads that could be introduced uh, perhaps by contamination uh, or perhaps by some errors introduced during the PCR or the uh, sequencing process. But when we know we're just looking at a single individual and a sample, it's pretty easy just to discard those because um, either one or two alleles are really gonna pop out as really abundant in that sequencing. However, when we have an environmental DNA sample, we no longer have that individual level information. We can't link any sequence to any individual. And now we just have a distribution of read frequencies for several, for many alleles. And that could be coming from any number of individuals. And so it becomes really difficult at this point to distinguish rare alleles from things like PCR or sequencing errors or contamination. And so we did develop a pipeline. I'm just showing kind of with the red line of, you know, perhaps like a threshold, but we designed a pipeline to try to better understand the sequencing errors, to better understand this um, contamination, to start to draw that line between um, rare alleles, true rare alleles and errors. Uh, but I will say this does remain a major challenge with environmental DNA research, um, looking at within species genetic variation. Okay, so I said we have an environmental DNA sample. We have the fin clips from all of the individuals in the mesocosm. We want to look at the allele frequencies between those two. So what I'm showing here is the allele frequencies from the genotyped individuals on the x-axis, the allele frequencies from the mesocosm eDNA on the y-axis, and each point in this plot is going to be um, uh, the, the frequency of an allele with the different colors denoting the different loci. What you can see here is that eDNA is not only recovering microsatellite alleles, but it's doing so at the frequencies that we expect or that we know to be true in the sampled population. So this is really great. Um, we can reliably estimate uh, population allele frequencies just by taking an environmental DNA sample. Now this is an amizocosm experiment. This is in a very simplified environment. So we also conducted a field trial to see, okay, can we do this in a real um, field setting where there's a lot of other things going on? There's environmental DNA degradation and transport, and there's other species present. Um, and in fact, we do see you know, a slight decrease in the correlation coefficient, a little bit, a little bit more noise, uh, but in general, environmental DNA is still telling us um, some pretty powerful information about the uh, frequency of the alleles um, at these different microsatellite loci. Okay, so here we've established, we can not only detect microsatellite alleles, but we can estimate population allele frequencies from these eDNA samples. And now we're ready to go out into the field and apply this in a population genetics context. All right, so we went out, I went out into the field with, um, with help with, uh, from some undergraduate researchers, uh, Maria and Diana. We went to 13 sites across the invaded range of the round gobies. And at each site, we collected up to 30 individual round gobies, as well as three environmental DNA samples. I will say I am coloring these sites um, in a spectral rainbow pattern going from west to east. Um, I'll retain this for uh, future slides. Uh, but what we found 
was that we can, in fact, in real um, field settings, recover or we can recover these microsatellite um, alleles. So between um, the eDNA and the genotyped individuals, we were able to recover 260 of the same alleles. There were several alleles that we only detected by genotyping individuals and several alleles that we only detected with environmental DNA. When I looked a little bit closer, um, the majority of these alleles were really rare. They were either re really rare in the genotyped individuals or really rare in the environmental DNA samples. So again, this highlights that it can be really difficult to distinguish between what's true low-level genetic variation or rare alleles and what is perhaps um, some sort of error or contamination in the sample. Um, because it could be that um, environmental DNA is just not detecting true um, low-frequency alleles, or perhaps by only sampling 30 individuals, uh, we're not actually detecting all of the genetic variation in that population. So I think there is um, a lot more uh, research that could be done to make sure that we're maximizing the detection of these low-frequency alleles. We also um, discovered that there's a lot of variation uh, within and among sampling locations in both the terms of the number of sequencing reads as well as the number of alleles that we could detect um, at that site. Um, so I said nuclear DNA, we do expect it to be in lower abundance. So I do think there's just a lot of sampling stochasticity um, and that, you know, depending on the exact environment you're sampling, um, the conditions or the um, activity of the species, you may or may not be able to detect that, um, you know, nuclear genetic variation that we're hoping to. But um, we did, so at this point, we did decide to exclude um, six of our 13 sites because we just weren't detecting enough um, sequencing reads or enough, enough alleles to really conduct population genetic assessments. But of the remaining sites, we did run a principal component analysis of the allele frequencies in both the genotyped individuals as well as the environmental DNA samples. And so this is gonna tell us something about the population genetic structure across these sites in the invaded range. So by just looking at the genotype tissues, we see um, that the primary factor governing um, genetic structuring, at least across that first principal component, is longitude. So we see that there's a distinct gradient going um, from the westernmost site in Lake Michigan, that's shown in the blue, uh, to the Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair sites in the middle, and then on the east, um, looking at the more inland Finger Lakes region and Lake Ontario sites. So this, is, uh, this follows what we know about the invasion process of the round goby. Um, so previous work has shown that there was a large um, introduction in about 1990, but since that time they've spread primarily via natural dispersal uh, throughout their range and that we do expect patterns of isolation by distance. So closer um, populations in space are gonna be more similar genetically. And that is what we do find by looking at the genotype tissues. We also find that to be true by looking at environmental DNA. So we see remarkably similar patterns uh, by just looking at the environmental DNA samples among these sites. We see that longitudinal gradient primarily structuring population genetic differentiation um, in these populations. Okay, so we can learn something about population allele frequencies. We can learn something about population structure. And what we, the last thing we wanted to show with this experiment was whether we could conduct uh, pairwise population genetic differences using environmental DNA. So traditional metrics for this, you might think of things like FST or analogs to FST. Uh, these typically require um, an understanding of individual genotypes or at least the number of individuals um, that you're looking at. Um, but as I said, with environmental DNA, we don't have that information. So instead we're using this allele frequency difference, the AFD, um, which is just an alternative to FST metrics uh, to help us get an understanding of pairwise population differentiation without the need for individual genotypes. So this AFD only requires um, population level allele frequencies. So we looked at these pairwise population differences uh, with both the genotyped individuals as well as the environmental DNA samples. What I'm showing in this plot is uh, each point is a pairwise population comparison. So the color as well as the shape of the dot is gonna denote the two populations being compared. And we're looking at the allele frequency differences, um, whether that's calculated based on genotype tissues or environmental DNA samples. As you can see, we're getting pretty similar estimates, uh, regardless of whether that's calculated from individuals or from eDNA, 
where populations that are more genetically similar based on um, genotyping the tissues are also similar with environmental DNA and vice versa. Okay, so now we've established, uh, we can detect species with environmental DNA. We can detect broad patterns of genetic variation uh, with environmental DNA. We can also start to get more detailed population genetic patterns by looking at the nuclear uh, genome. Okay, so now what I wanna move into is how we might use this information, this genetic variation that we're detecting in environmental samples to start to understand something about species abundance. So species abundance is another, um, another metric that's really important um, and of really um, in wide interest to people studying environmental DNA. So how are people looking at species abundance with environmental DNA? So as of right now, most studies looking at this are looking at the correlation between the concentration of DNA or the amount of DNA in the sample and the species abundance in the environment. So this is under the assumption that if there's more species present in a given environment, uh, there, there will be more of that focal species DNA in the environment. But and then a meta-analysis in 2019 showed um, that at least in natural systems, that correlation um, or the amount of DNA in the sample only explained about 55% of the variation in species abundance. And this is because there's a lot of other things going on uh, that might affect the amount of DNA in the sample other than just the number of individuals in that environment. So the amount of DNA that we're capturing in an environmental sample is subject to, again, not only the number of species or number of individuals in the environment, um, but there's differences in shedding rates among um, individuals. Uh, there's DNA transport. DNA is um, degrading or being decayed. It's settling out, it's being resuspended. So there is you know, a, a large number of complex processes that's driving the amount of DNA in the sample. And this is what's preventing us from getting really accurate estimates of species abundance from environmental DNA. So we need to start accounting for some of this variation if we wanna improve our abundance estimates. So just focusing on organismal shedding rates here, I'll show for example, um, say there's five small individuals in one environment and a single large individual in another environment. You can expect just by nature of biomass that we might get similar amounts of genetic material of that species in each of those two environments. When in reality, there's large differences in the number of individuals contributing that genetic material. So there have been advances in the environmental DNA literature um, to try to account for um, species activity levels. Uh, there's been allometric scaling efforts. Um, I think last week Stella talked about how we could start looking at um, DNA half-lives or we could start looking at DNA degradation rates um, to start to better understand the abundance of individuals in a sample. But we think of this a little bit differently. So with, if we have genetic variation in the sample, we can kind of bypass all these differences among individual shedding rates to start to look at the unique, the number of unique genetic individuals in a sample. So this actually originated in the forensics literature. So forensic scientists wanted to go to a crime scene and know exactly how many people were there. Um, but Suresh Sethi um, brought this into the ecological realm um, in both a simulation experiment as well as a diet analysis um, to use genetic variation to estimate the um, exact number of species that were in a sample. And so this is called the DNA mixture model or a contributor estimation. And I'll just walk through really quickly how this is working. So say the true number of individuals in our sample is three, and at a given locus, they have genotypes RR, RT, and SU. If you took an environmental DNA sample um, in the environment where those are from, you would detect four distinct alleles. So we know if we're looking at a diploid species that this is at least two individuals, at least two heterozygotes. But because there's some redundancy in the genotypes of these individuals, um, this would lead to a systematic underestimate of the number of individuals if we're only looking at the number of alleles detected. So we can actually use the population allele frequencies and apply the DNA mixture model, which calculates the likelihood that any number of given individuals X could produce the observed alleles A given their associated population allele frequencies P. So if you go through and you do the math um, in this example, you would get a maximum likelihood estimate of three individuals, which is the true number of individuals um, in this example. 
So we applied this DNA mixture model, this framework, uh, to our mesocosm experiment. And if you recall, we had gobies in different densities in these mesocosms. There was one, three, five, and 10 gobies in the mesocosms. So we used the alleles that we detected in the environmental DNA samples to try to estimate the abundance in each of these mesocosms, the absolute abundance in the mesocosms. So what I'm showing on the right hand side um, is the bias in that estimated number minus the true number of individuals. So anything along that horizontal zero line is gonna be a perfect estimate of the number of gobies in each of these mesocosms. And you can see that we're seeing low levels of bias where we're pretty accurately estimating the number of round gobies in each of these mesocosms. And again, that's based on just the sample genetic material in an environmental DNA sample. So this is great. In a, again, a simplified mesocosm environment, we can estimate up to 10 individuals pretty accurately. But we expect in a, in a real ecological setting that there's likely many more than 10 individuals. So we also wanted to test the limits of this approach. Uh, you know, just how many individuals can we estimate from an environmental sample using this DNA mixture approach? So we then, we simulated um, mixtures of individuals based on a published GOBI data set. And so this data set had um, genotypes for 127 gobies um, at both microsatellite loci as well as uh, mitochondrial, um, a segment of the mitochondrial genome. Um, so just focusing on um, the microsatellite alleles from those 127 individuals, we drew different mixtures of them. Um, so um, up to 100 individuals, we, co we constructed a mixture of individuals and we applied that DNA mixture model to see how well we could estimate um, the number of individuals that, that um, created that DNA mixture. So what I'm showing in the purple line is our estimated number of individuals uh, minus the true number of individuals. Um, so again, anything along that zero line is gonna be perfect estimate. When we have population level allele frequencies from 100 individuals. So if you recall, the DNA mixture model does require population allele frequencies. And what we realized was that when we estimate allele frequencies from many individuals, so 100 individuals, there's a lot of rare alleles that could be detected. And so when we detect those rare alleles in our environmental samples, that provides a lot of power to determine that there's a lot of individuals in that sample. However, when we estimate population level allele frequencies with only 25 individuals, uh, we lose that power. So there's, a lot, there's fewer rare alleles um, in the population allele frequencies. And so we don't have the power to really distinguish between um, um, the number of individuals above about um, 10 or so. And so we get a systematic underestimate of the number of individuals. Um, but if you have um, population allele frequencies from up to 100 individuals, we are showing um, pretty reliable estimates of abundance up to 100. Uh, we saw similar patterns uh, looking at a segment of the mitochondrial genome. So again, we just um, simulated mixtures of individuals, uh, but we were only able to estimate up to about uh, uh, 50 individuals, um, again, using population allele frequencies from about 100 individuals. So from this, we learned that if you're going, wanting to go out and sample an environment, estimate abundance um, using this DNA mixture model approach, you likely want to use microsatellite alleles and you definitely wanna get uh, population allele frequencies from as many individuals as possible. You really wanna maximize your detection of rare alleles because that's really gonna be where your power comes from um, to determine high numbers of individuals in a sample. Okay, so that was a mesocosm example. We did a simulation experiment. Now we wanted to take this out into the field to see if we could estimate brown goby abundance um, using that DNA mixture model in a field-based setting. And for this study, I partnered with um, Pete Esselman and his crew at uh, USGS um, at the Great Lakes Science Center. Um, and they went out and got us a ground truth, um, ground goby density in Lake Huron. So they go out every summer and estimate ground goby um, abundance using this benthic AUV. And so this is an autonomous underwater vehicle and it coasts right along the lake bottom and it captures images of the round goby, which is a benthic species, meaning it lives right on the lake bottom. So from these images, they, they have folks go in um, and you know, outline the gobies, they apply an AI algorithm, rather complicated. But what we get at the end of the day is a density estimate of round gobies at these different sites in Lake Huron. So they did this at 15 sites. Um, at five of the sites, the image quality was too poor to get um, reliable goby density estimates. But in the remaining 10 sites, 
uh, we do see that there's a gradient going from north to south in terms of round goby density. So they're more abundant in the southern sites than in the northern sites. And what we wanted to see is if we could recover that gradient, again, using environmental DNA sampling at each of these sites. Like I showed in the simulation, we really wanted to use microsatellite markers because that would give us the, the highest ability to um, estimate high numbers of round gobies. But what we saw in these samples, um, just by looking at the DNA concentration of both mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA, is that we had really low nuclear DNA con uh, concentrations. So like I said from the start, we do expect nuclear DNA to be less abundant in environmental samples. But in this case, it was just, it was too, there wasn't enough nuclear DNA in these samples to really do a detailed uh, microsatellite analysis. So instead we wanted to be focused on a mitochondrial marker. Um, I did show in the simulations that we could estimate up to about 50 individuals in a sample using a reasonably um, diverse mitochondrial marker. So we needed to design a mitochondrial marker that contained a lot of genetic variation, much more than like in the CO1 region. So we targeted the um, D-loop region of the round goby mitochondrial genome, and we determined there's really high levels of genetic variation in this region that might allow us to get estimates, accurate estimates of the number of individuals in these samples. So we went out at each of the sites that the AUV um, also went out at um, to get abundance estimates from environmental DNA based on both that quantitative PCR or that traditional DNA concentration approach, as well as this contributor estimation approach, which is looking at the genetic diversity in a sample. And we wanted to see how these two approaches for abundance estimations compared. And again, our um, expectation was that this contributor estimation approach would provide more accurate estimates of round goby abundance because it's accounting for that among individual differences in shedding rates. But first looking at quantitative PCR, so this is looking at the quantity or the of, of round goby DNA in a sample or the DNA concentration in a sample. Um, I've ordered these sites along that north to south gradient. And if you recall, we do expect um, that, there to be, that there will be more round gobies in those southern sites than in the northern sites. And in fact, we do see that there's more DNA, more round goby DNA in those southern sites than in the northern sites. So if we're just looking at that correlation-based approach, um, we, you know, we're explaining again about 50% of the variation in round goby abundance based on the DNA quantity. And that's on par with what that meta-analysis showed um, that we're explaining about half the variation. So not bad, um, but what we wanted to do again was to see if we could get an improved estimate based on that genetic diversity in the sample. And not to build things up <laughs> too much, but um, I actually don't have that data. So what happened was the D-loop region was in fact really abundant. And in fact, it was too, or it wasn't abundant, it was uh, really diverse, um, but it was actually too diverse. There was too much genetic variation within that region. And so the primers that we designed, the, the DNA primers we designed, um, actually didn't latch on to the Gobi DNA very well. And our sequencing run was pretty overwhelmed um, by microbial DNA um, and not Gobi DNA. So we didn't get um, the, the, D -loop, the round Gobi D-loop region that we wanted to do these abundance estimates with. Um, and so instead we're going back to the drawing board with this one, we're gonna target a few other loci in the mitochondrial genome uh, to see if we can you know, try this approach with a different marker that is you know, variable, but perhaps not quite as variable as the D-loop region. All right, so with, um, with my dissertation research, or at least with this nuclear DNA component of my dissertation research, I did show that we can use nuclear genetic markers, um, that they can be amplified from environmental DNA samples in both mesocosm context as well as environmental, con uh, as well as environmental field contexts. Now we can use environmental DNA to estimate population level allele frequencies, genetic structure, and genetic differentiation of species. We also can use this genetic variation that we're detecting in an environmental DNA sample to estimate species abundance. And at least we did this in mesocosms and we did a simulation experiment, but that in the field, there's still a little bit more work to be done because we are limited uh, by either low DNA concentrations of nuclear DNA or nonspecific priming within really hyper variable regions of the mitochondrial genome. So more work to be done um, in, in that. So the field of environmental DNA for at least macroorganisms has been around since about 2008. 
And in that time, we've gone from single species detections to full community assessments. And now we're moving into assessments of interspecific genetic variation. I've shown you how we can um, estimate um, species, uh, fish communities um, with environmental DNA, how we can look at um, species detections with environmental DNA, and how eDNA is more efficient than other approaches, but that by combining approaches, we can maximize um, species detections. I show you that in Lake Tanganyika, um, there is genetic variation among populations uh, that's based on the history of the lake and that we can use environmental DNA to reconstruct those genetic differences among populations for several species at once. And then I also showed you that um, environmental DNA can amplify nuclear genetic markers that we can use that to estimate allele frequencies and conduct population genetic analyses. So if we wanna finish this out, um, this isn't anything I did, but I do wanna say that I do think the field of environmental DNA going forward um, has a lot of potential in the whole genome sequencing realm. So the traditional idea with environmental DNA that it was, was that it was highly fragmented DNA pieces that you could only amplify short segments of DNA in a sample. But I think that's being replaced by an understanding that most of the DNA that we're getting in environmental DNA samples is actually um, bound within organelles or whole cells or even clumps of cells. So I think if the field can start to work on um, advancing technologies and uh, methodologies to start isolating these single cells, I do think the idea of whole genome sequencing and individual level identification um, is possible within the eDNA world. All right, so going back to this, um, the threatened species. I think there's a really important um, opportunity or a really great opportunity for environmental DNA to start closing the size, shrinking the size of these gray portions of the bars uh, to start providing data for these species for which we're data deficient, for which we don't have enough information. Uh, because it can be really efficient and more efficient than other sampling approaches, um, I do think environmental DNA provides a great way to learn something about not just species, but also populations and abundance. Um, and if we can start to close those gaps, start to understand um, the risk species are threatened, we might be able to better design uh, conservation solutions to the biodiversity crisis. Okay, I do wanna just briefly talk about what I'm hoping to do as a Living Earth Collaborative postdoc. And for that research, I'm actually moving into a species group that's not even represented um, in this figure. Um, and that's the microbial communities. So microbial communities are often excluded from discussions in conservation um, and even um, macroorganism species ecology. And that could be because there's just a not great understanding of their importance or because they have historically been um, challenging to characterize. But with the advent of next generation sequencing using the same approaches that I used with my environmental DNA research, it has become much easier to characterize uh, the microbial communities as well as the microbial communities associated with hosts um, or the microbiomes. Um, and I think there's a growing um, appreciation for the importance of these microbial communities uh, for things like ecosystem functioning as well as host, fit, host fitness and health. So what I'm showing here is the number of uh, microbial community surveys that are conducted and that have been conducted in freshwater environments. Um, and I think this represents a you know, still small but growing appreciation for the importance of uh, microbial communities in these environments. So I plan uh, with my Living Earth Collaborative postdoc research to characterize the structure, uh, the taxonomic composition, and the potential functional profile of the bacterial communities associated with both invasive species as well as the threatened native species to better understand how bacterial communities um, are associated with invasive and native species as well as uncover insights into potential invasion mechanisms. So for this, um, I'm going to still look at the round goby, the same species I looked at uh, with my dissertation research in both the native range as well as the invaded range, um, as well as a co-occurring native species um, that has been driven um, to population declines due to the round goby invasions um, at sites where it's co-occurring with the round goby, um, as well as sites ahead of the round goby invasion um, to see how the, um, how the, what the role of the microbiome might be in this species invasion. So with that research, I'll be uh, working with uh, Dr. Feng Zhang Ling, who's going to be bringing in the environmental uh, microbial expertise, um, and Dr. Jason Knopf, who's bringing in the aquatic ecology and fish expertise. <laughs> 
So I do just want to highlight last um, that there is a research symposium happening in just a few weeks um, at the zoo. Um, this is going to be um, focused on the microbes of diverse environments. Um, this is going to be researchers in the St. Louis area who are looking at um, microbial communities in environments. Um, and I think it should be um, a great symposium. So if you're interested in attending or if you're interested in presenting a poster, I believe you can still sign up through next week. Uh, so I would encourage folks uh, to do that. And uh, with that, I would like to thank my funding, my collaborators, my research assistants and support. I encourage anyone who's interested in talking about environmental DNA or microbiomes uh, to get in touch with me um, and I'll take questions. So for your um, species detection part, like the first one you presented on, were there any species that you were able to detect through capture that you couldn't detect with your eDNA samples? Yeah, so this person um, asked if there was any species that we detected with the capture sampling, so the nets um, or electrofishing that we couldn't detect with environmental DNA. Uh, so there were four species that we detected um, with the staining um, and the um, gill netting, no, not the gill netting. What it was, uh, staining and fike netting. Um, there was four species that we detected with either one, either of those approaches that we didn't detect with environmental DNA. When we looked a little bit more closely, these were really rarely detected, um, in those samples. So I think, um, each of these was represented by just one or two individuals that were captured on a single day with those approaches. Um, so that just highlights um, that environmental DNA is, is great at detecting species, but perhaps uh, we need more representative spatial sampling or temporal sampling throughout the season to really capture those rare species. Um, but because we didn't detect those with environmental DNA, that's why the, the optimization did include some level of spike netting um, and staining in them uh, to maximize species detections. Yeah. Um. I really like the, the, the chart that you show, the last chart that you show, um, the, the, which species are threatened and so on. But I also think uh, there is a bar missing and is the species that we don't know that exist yet. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of environments that are under study, for example, the deep sea. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how this could be adapted to discover new species. Mm -hmm. So this question is about using environmental DNA for species discovery. Yeah. I believe, I think there's a lot of people really excited about that prospect. Um, and so I know there was even an article, I think last year, about how we could use the environmental DNA to find out where the Loch Ness Monster is. Um, but so environmental DNA, we can't tell what species it is unless we have some sort of reference genetic material to compare it to. But what eDNA can do is say, okay, we, we have a, you know, a fish species. Um, we know that it's in this family. We might even know it's in this genus. And it doesn't align with any of our reference um, species uh, that we know in these taxonomic databases. So it must either be you know, something genetically different within that same species or a completely new species. So I think in that way, it can kind of give us some insight into like where we might want to focus our efforts into species um, discovery. But I, but in and of itself alone, we wouldn't have anything to catalog. We wouldn't have any um, type of morphological data. So in and of itself, it can't tell us the whole story, but it might be able to help us focus our efforts on where we might start to look with some capture-based um, approaches. Yeah. Um, I know recently there's been a lot of um, recently, there's been a lot of research on uh, the impact of microbial diversity on uh, human health. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that your eDNA methods could uh, help characterize uh, microbial communities on or within the body? So people quarrel about whether microbial communities is environmental DNA. I don't think it's really important to make the distinction, um, but rather uh, what you're asking. Um, so certainly we could, you know, swab um, our environment, we can swab ourselves to learn something about the microbial communities on and around us, um, start to understand how that might be affecting our human health. 
Uh, that's not really my realm of research, but I know um, there's lots of microbiome um, and microbial ecology um, and community folks working on similar questions to that um, here on campus. So I would, if you are interested, they'll probably be talking about that at the symposium or um, um, yeah, somewhere else. Hi, very good talk, by the way. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, I have a question about uh, estimating the number of individuals from the allele diversity. Mm -hmm. You use a likelihood, and that likelihood you must have assumed, at least for nuclear DNA, a system of mating. Because, mm -hmm. say, if you have high inbreeding, you're going to have very few alleles per individual, mm -hmm. whereas if you have avoidance of inbreeding, it's the opposite, and random mating would be in between. So, how do you accommodate a uh, system of mating in that estimation procedure? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question, um, in case folks online can hear, is um, the, the DNA mixture model does assume um, some sort of mating in the system um, and how and what assumptions we're making with that. So um, it does the, the model does assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, uh, which is a big assumption, and we're certainly violating that in some instances. Um, in my simulation paper, I will be writing up about how we're not yet um, in that study able to explore um, the violations of Hardy Weinberg and the implications for estimating the number of individuals. Um, but I do think um, folks who are perhaps more skilled with simulation studies should start to look at that um, and start to understand where our limitations might lie in terms of the, the violations of that assumption. But you are correct. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Really awesome talk. Uh, we have a question from the YouTube chat from um, Suzanne Renner. Uh, it says, in your graph, you have flying birds. How do people use environmental DNA to infer flying bird abundance if they're not water poles? Yeah, so, um, you know, environmental DNA, the whole, the whole field is still primarily fish focused or largely fish focused or at least aquatic organism focused. Um, if we want to start looking at um, bird diversity, uh, there are folks using, um, as, as this questioner said, um, waterfowl, so birds that are associated with water, uh, we can still take environmental DNA samples. Um, but folks are also looking at um, airborne DNA. Um, we do need some sort of like focus or some sort of grouping of the species. So that might be uh, perhaps at a water bath or a bird um, house or something of the sort um, to where we could focus our efforts to sample the environment. Um, that's not my realm, but I know there's certainly some really exciting research coming out in the airborne eDNA realm, um, and there is some um, bird research coming out as well. So um, not really my um, field, but I know there is some exciting work. Yeah. Um, going back to the mixture model again, following up on that, uh, when you're trying to identify numbers of individuals or abundance, uh, does it have to make assumptions about the relative amount of DNA that individuals are leaving in the pool, does it assume individuals are represented equally, which isn't necessarily going to be true for fish, which range enormously in body size? Yep. Um, this person is asking about whether there's assumptions about contributions of DNA from different individuals and whether that might um, impact the abundance estimate. So with the mixture model, um, we do have population allele frequencies, but in our sample, we're just looking at the presence of alleles. So as long as we're detecting the presence of allele, no matter how abundant it is, um, that, that it shouldn't matter how much DNA came from any individual. Um, so as long as it's abundant enough in the sample to detect the allele from that individual, it shouldn't matter whether different individuals are contributing different amounts of DNA. Hi, uh, super interested in your microsatellite um, experiments and their use in population genetic studies. Does the method break down in environments where there are many species that are closely related as your primers start to bind to multiple species? Or is there a way around that? That's a good question. Uh, this person is asking about um, closely related species in the environment and looking at interspecific genetic variation if we might uh, co-amplify those closely related species. Um, that is certainly a worry, and that's why we focused on the round goby, which doesn't have a lot of co-occurring closely related species because it's invasive. 
Um, there are folks thinking about using this for like salmon species, um, for which that would be a greater problem. Um, but this is a problem with all environmental DNA research, even like conserved mitochondrial markers. What you need is to make sure that you have a priming region that is specific to that species. Um, and so if we're looking at nuclear markers, that may be more challenging. Um, there's not as many nuclear genomes uh, available to start comparing to, but if at least you know the closely related co-occurring species um, and you can you know, sequence these gene regions for those species, um, you would really wanna design markers that are just looking at that specific species and not co-amplifying other closely related species. Of course, unless that's what you're wanting to do, as was the case with the Lake Tanganyika cichlid study, we amplified all cichlid species. And so that was kind of the goal with that research, but yeah. Okay, we'll do maybe just one more question. And then if you have any other questions, you can ask them at the reception. Yes, yeah. yeah, we have another one from the YouTube chat from Ari Miller. Uh, great talk. Does eDNA provide sufficiently non-fragmented DNA for quality genome assemblies? Or is the value more just shut on the sequencing style to align reads and find what's present? Yeah, um, so this person is asking more about on that whole genome sequencing um, front. Um, I don't think to date um, there's, um, there's a lot of movement in folks doing um, you know, whole genome assembly or um, shotgun sequencing. I know like Christy Diner did a study where she um, sequenced the whole mitogenome from environmental samples. Um, so um, I know there's a lot of discussion about long read sequencing. Um, but yeah, I, 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 that's not my expertise at all, I know. But again, I know there's a lot of really talented folks looking um, at that realm of, of longer fragments um, or perhaps whole genome things. Thank you, Kara.